Hello everyone, my name is Lori DeBold, and I have to start this off by saying I am so sorry that I was even a feminist. I had no idea any of these issues were going on with our men. So men, I am so sorry that I just totally lost track of what the feminist movement was doing. You see, December 20th of 2019, my son was found guilty of sexual assault. He's innocent. But because of all the laws and because of everything that have taken place, we weren't able to prove his innocence. See, when I was a feminist back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, things were different back then. But there was a dark side to it. I was born in 1965. My dad was a truck driver and he was gone quite a bit. I mean, it wasn't uncommon for him to have been gone for a week, sometimes two weeks at a time. And so we were raised by my mom and she's an artist. So she painted a lot back then. Um, she was also able to work a part-time job and then sell Avon too. But even though I didn't spend as much time with my dad, it was my dad that taught me valuable life lessons. Like one of them, don't label people. And for God's sakes, don't use the word chauvinistic pig if you have no idea what it means. <laughs> I remember Oh, watching TV one night with my dad and I'm up there flipping the channels um, because we didn't have remote controls back then but I'm up there flipping the channels and every single channel there was something going on in Chicago so there's breaking news about something in Chicago now back then I lived in the country and we were surrounded by cornfields and I didn't really care and after I made that comment my dad looked at me and he goes this isn't about your small little world. You need to open your eyes, Lori. There is a whole world that's happening out there and the events that are happening out there are someday gonna crash into your world if you don't do something about it and pay attention. I mean, back then, I didn't care. I just wanted to watch my show. I should have paid attention. Back then, um, the, the things that influenced me most was what was on TV and what was happening in my school. You see, back then, um, we heard a lot about burning the bra. Yeah, and, and as shy as I was and a, a girl with very low confidence, I thought, that is cool. I'm going to burn my bra, too. No idea what it was all about, but I wanted to burn my bra. And then, if you remember the commercials back then, um, some of you were older, <laughs> might remember the commercial by Anjali, where the woman, the smart dressed woman, comes out and, and she sings about, you know, she could bring home the bacon and she could fry it up in a pan and she could never, ever, ever let her man forget he was a man. Um, back then, it was like, oh, that's cool. So I can work at these powerful jobs and, and have it all. Mm. Divorce was pretty rampant back then too. It was um, the explosion of divorces. And so when my best friend's dad and mom got divorced, he was a preacher. He was the preacher in our church. And I was really thrown off by that, really thrown off. Um, and then when my parents got divorced, I was like, wow. So when I leave high school, I'm going to make darn sure that I can support myself, right? And I didn't want a job as a secretary. <laughs> My junior year, I remember my counselor pulling me into her office, my guidance counselor. And she said, so Lori, what do you want to do when you're done with high school? Okay, so I really wanted to tell her that 
I wanted to join the Air Force, like my grandfather. My grandfather fought in World War II and was a prisoner of war for 18 months. My grandmother was a Rosie Riveter. And I just thought that was so amazing. And that's what I wanted to do. But I was shy. And I had absolutely no confidence. And so when I shrugged my shoulders at my high school guidance counselor, she said, well, you could become a secretary. And I just went, okay. But in my head, I'm thinking, oh, hell no. I'm not going to become a secretary. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I left high school, right, thinking I'm going to go out there and get a job so that not if I get divorced, but so that when I get divorced, I'll be able to support myself and not have to depend on a man. That was my outlook then. And Dad, I'm so sorry. It was then that I just totally concentrated on my own little world. And I lost track of what feminism was doing at the time. I was learning how to survive in the real world. I moved from Illinois to Texas and I got my first job as a secretary. Okay, and so like at that point I gave up, forget it, I don't care. I just want a job, I want to be able to pay my bills, blah, 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 blah. blah. So meanwhile, in the 80s and the 90s, Amber was born. Amber is my son's accuser. As I left high school in 1983, she was born. And so, not keeping my eye on the ball, I just lived my life. I moved from Texas and then I moved to Arizona and decided that my family was important, so I moved back to Illinois. I met a man, got married, and got divorced. <laughs> um, it, long story, different story. And so I met another man, and I loved him a great deal. I still do. We had two sons in the early 90s, Kevin and Tyler. Kevin and Tyler entered their school years with girl power and zero tolerance. In other words, boy bad, girl good. And even then, I didn't look outside of my little world to see what was happening with feminism. Even when it was hitting me in the face with the girl power and the zero tolerance, I didn't do anything. I had no confidence. I didn't know what I was doing. Back in the 90s, we had the Office of Violence Against Women created. It was the 80s and 90s that created the woman that accused my son and hurt me dearly. So let me take you to our accuser, all right? Her name is Amber, and um, that's as much as I can give you about her name. But back in the early 2000s, she was living in Minnesota and she married a man, and they had a little girl. Now this man wanted to do everything he could to raise and support his family. So he joined the Air Force. Yeah, that was cool. He joined the Air Force. He was willing to sacrifice his life for his family, his country. While he was away, his friends kept telling him, hey, she's, uh, she's violating the marriage. She is um, sleeping around with others. And, and he first, you know, he wouldn't believe it until he got the Dear John letter. And he said that that was the hardest time in his life, trying to get through training for the Air Force, knowing that his wife was screwing around. They ended up getting divorced and somewhere around, I don't know, 2012 or so, she took her daughter, their daughter, 
And she moved to Illinois, my state. I talked to that father and he had no more money left after the divorce to fight. He had very little contact with his daughter. She made sure that all the phone calls and all the texts were closely monitored by her, so she cut them off in a minute. Sometimes she wouldn't even answer the phone so that he could talk to his little girl. After she moved to Illinois, she met another man. This is victim number two. They uh, fell in love and she got pregnant with her second little girl. Shortly before the marriage, though, uh, he found out what she was like and he broke off the engagement. And what did she do? She stole $10,000 of his and moved back up to Minnesota. But this man had money at the time and he filed an emergency court order and the court ordered her back to Illinois. Ever since then, they've had ongoing custody issues. He just wanted peace. He just wanted his daughter to know both parents because it was about his little girl. She wanted war. She wanted war and it dragged him down to where now he has no money left. And so let me tell you about her third victim, my son, Kevin. June 23rd, 2015, my sons lost their father to suicide. It was my youngest son that came home and found him. Losing their dad to suicide just crushed their world, crushed mine. We were divorced at the time, but he was my parenting partner. Anyway, six weeks after their dad um, committed suicide, Kevin, my oldest, the one that's been accused, went to a party. And this is where he met Amber. He was 23 at the time and she was 32. They hit it off right away. I mean, there are witnesses saying that they were on the patio, knee to knee and talking for a, the majority of the night. She had invited him to stay home with her that night and said that she would give him a ride back home in the morning. Well, sometime during the night, um, she had left the party for a few hours. Um, and then she came back to the party and it was late. And it's there where she um, hooked up with my son again and she led him back to her condo. My son said that she opened the door, made sure her two little girls who were then four and I think 11 or 12 at the time, she wanted to make sure that they were in bed once they were in bed she came back out and pulled him in to her bathroom. She seductively removed his clothes and took off her own, pulled him into the shower where they had conceptual sex. After that, they crawled back into her bed and went to sleep. In the next morning when she woke up, okay, there's my son with her and somehow the four-year-old little girl had crawled back into bed. And so she picked the four-year-old four back up off the bed and put her on the couch. Then she left her condo because she needed to find her phone. So she left my son sleeping in her condo with her two daughters while she went over to the neighbor's house to try and find her phone. After that, she came back and she jumped in the shower for an hour and was getting ready for work. Meanwhile, Kevin is still sleeping. There are two little girls of hers in the house. All right. 
sometime during the shower, shortly when she was almost done um, getting ready for work, the four-year-old came in and said, Mommy, why were you bumping butts with that boy? That's when she was concerned. She wasn't concerned waking up to my son. She wasn't concerned when she left her condo and my son alone with her girls. She wasn't concerned while she was in the shower. She was only concerned because her four-year-old daughter had seen her have sex with another man. Now, remember early in the party, she left for a couple of hours and we're assuming that it was that time where she had first sex. My son had no clue what was happening. He would never have gone back with her late in the night if he'd have known that she had just had sex with someone earlier. Now remember also that there's custody issues going on with the second father, right? It was his visitation night. She had to drop him off and she was worried about her little girl telling her dad about her mom bumping butts in bed with another man. So she didn't go to the hospital right away for a rape kit. She waited. She waited all day. Her little girl was with her father when she decided to go. <laughs> there were two DNA that were found. But nobody knew it at the time. Of course there were two DNA. She had sex in that night with two different men. So later, when she went to pick her daughter up, after the rape kit, she told the father, the four-year-old, I've been raped. And then she left. Well, the father was concerned because the daughter was maybe involved, right? What happened to the daughter? Did something happen to her? So he called the police that night. The police got him in touch with the de detective who was at Amber's house at the time investigating. It was then that the father told this detective the rest of the story, that his little girl was in bed, supposedly. She saw them bumping butts. It was at that time, the officer, the detective told Amber, you need to take your child in. Like, I'm sure he's thinking, why didn't you do that before? None of us. None of us knows why she didn't do it. Well, let me take this back. We all know why she did it. Because she wasn't raped. She was just trying to save her butt. <sighs> she didn't want to lose her kids. But you know what? DCFS, Department of Children and Family Services, got involved. Because the father called. And she lost custody of her daughters. So the father of the youngest one got custody of the, the four-year-old. Now the father up in Minnesota, he had no clue. She didn't tell him everything that was happening. He didn't find out that she had lost custody until this spring when I talked to him about it. The older girl, his daughter, stayed with the grandmother in Minnesota and he told me that if he had known that that was happening, he would have fought for custody but he had no clue. And now, in 2019, Amber has accused the father of the little girl of choking their girl. There's no medical records. I've looked at the police reports. There is nothing. In fact, on TikTok, two days later, this little girl is on TikTok and she has no choke marks. She doesn't look afraid and she looks perfectly normal. It's been over a year and a half now since this man has seen his little daughter. They're still fighting it in court. He has absolutely no money for an attorney. And this has just been dragging on and on. And meanwhile, he's cried to me. He just wants to see his little girl. He just wants to be her dad. But Amber won't let him. And there's possibly a fourth victim um, just in the springtime, 
Amber had posted some pictures about getting a puppy from her boyfriend, Scott. But in July, we see a new man that she's now engaged to as of July, and this man is from Minnesota. So you see, she's trying to get back to Minnesota, and we're positive that once she's there, that man will be the fourth victim. The 80s and the 90s were toxic, and I took my eye off the ball and didn't even see all of this happening. Let me tell you about our trial. This was our judge's first trial. She was the assistant prosecutor in the Laquan McDonald case. She fought against the officer. The prosecutor educated the jury on the Me Too movement. Illinois rape shield laws would not allow us to bring in that second DNA. The judge, and I believe very incorrectly, stated, you cannot bring up her past. And we were like, wait a minute. The second DNA happened between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. that night where she claims my son raped her. How can we not bring that in? But we couldn't. Nor could we talk about the motive for Amber lying. She was worried about the fathers getting custody of her daughters. DCFS took her daughters away that night. She lost custody because of that night. She was not properly supervising them that night. But the judge, the judge said we couldn't bring that in. I'm like, that's her motive. There's more. There's prosecutorial misconduct and witness tampering. The eldest daughter stood and testified that she saw my son come home early with her mother and help her under the shower because she was sick. But actually it was some other guy and some other girl that did that. It wasn't my son. The mom, a week before the trial, had coached her daughter and said, you've got it wrong. It wasn't this guy and this woman. It was Kevin. So Kevin, you saw Kevin do this. You saw Kevin come to the house when I was taking a shower early at around 10. So she got on the stand and said, it was Kevin. It wasn't Kevin, it was some other guy. Witness tampering. Well, the same girl was supposed to identify the defendant. And this is where we have prosecutorial misconduct. The prosecutor asked her to identify who in this room is Kevin. She looked across the whole courtroom. She looked at the front where my son was sitting with, her, with his attorneys. She looked through the galleys. She looked everywhere from left to right and began to focus on someone towards the back. And just as she was about to raise her hand and point, the prosecutor stopped. We, we objected. We wanted him to finish identifying the defendant. The judge overruled and said he can do his questioning however he wants. So he goes on to ask her other questions and then he's getting ready to ask her to identify and he's motioning with his hand. Do you see the defendant here? He's pointing right at the table where my son is sitting with the attorneys. Do you see the defendant here? And she said, yes, that's him. She was led to identify my son. In post-trial motions, we argued, we asked 
for the video of that so we can prove prosecutorial misconduct. We asked for it, she denied it. She wasn't going to save it for this court. She wasn't going to save it for the appellate. She doesn't believe anything happened. We then came back with six witnesses. Kevin's uncle took the stand and testified to exactly what I just said. Six other people wrote stories saying the same thing that I just said. The judge ruled that, oh, this isn't a matter of who is it, because we already know who it was. So she denied our motion. We have several witnesses that came to the stand and said that my son came back from Amber's house and got some dry clothes and went back to Amber's house. I have phone records where, remember I said Amber lost her phone. She went to the neighbors to look for a phone in the next morning. I have phone records where my son's phone placed a call to her phone at two in the morning. The judge denied that as new evidence. She must have used it to look for her own phone. Look, she woke up. If she was really raped, why when she rolled over and saw my son, did she not call the police? Why did she leave her kids there with my son and go to the neighbors? Why did she leave my son sleeping and take a shower? And when she went to get a rape kit later that night, why did she not take her daughter? Because she wasn't raped. She wasn't going to take her daughter in for a rape kit because she didn't want her daughter to go through that. She wasn't raped. But she had to concoct the story. When my son took the stand, he was upset. He was upset because he was accused of something he didn't do. We had to take this all the way to trial. I had to spend thousands of dollars. He was upset. He told a story and he was angry and I don't blame him. We were angry too. We thought this trial was finally gonna be the one to prove his innocence. Um, and so um, the jury bought her story. Her story? She got on the stand and said, hey, I wasn't drunk. I was walking fine all night long. I went home at 10 o'clock and I went to bed and I didn't wake up until 6. Wait a minute. She slept through two, two sex incidences? She slept through two? When the judge read the verdict, um, sorry, my world fell apart. My little world fell apart because I wasn't paying attention to the issues out there. And I'm sorry. Feminism is on steroids today. And it's horrible. And you women are killing the men that I love, that we love. Let's go back to 2017. We have Emily Linden. Oh my God, Emily Linden is a Teen Vogue columnist. Teen Vogue, you know, the magazine that our teens read. She's quoted on Twitter as saying, Emily London, she's, she's quoted as saying on Twitter, I'm not at all concerned about men losing their jobs over false accusations of sexual assault and harassment. Dot, 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 sorry. Emily, sweetheart, Men are losing more than their jobs. Our men are losing their lives. Our men are committing suicide over false accusations. Our men are spending years in prison for something they didn't do. And you're sorry? And you don't care. Let's go back to Twitter, 2017, and Alyssa Milano. And me too. Oh, so this Alyssa would have me say 
that what happened to me when I was working as a secretary was rape, was sexual assault. No. My boss tried to kiss me one night. And I said, no, I, I'm, I have a boyfriend. I'm not interested. The Me Too movement would have me say, oh, I'm going to the police. I was sexually assaulted. B.S. No. In 2020, Tarana Burke of the Me Too movement had a Zoom conference with a bunch of other women's groups. And they were putting, or still putting together the survivor's agenda. And I thought, oh, uh, this would be interesting. So I joined that early planning session on Zoom and I posed a question to them and I said, are we ever in this Me Too movement, are we ever going to include our men that are sexually assaulted and abused? And I didn't think that they would take my question, but at the end, the very end, Tarana Burke took my question and admitted to doing a bad job of representing men who have been sexually assaulted and that going forward, they would try harder. I wasn't holding my breath. Just the other day, I was invited to the survivor's agenda again and their goal, they want me to everywhere. They want me to in our schools. No, Tarana, you're not going to get those movements into our schools. There's been enough damage done and you've done no justice to the real victims of rape. Let's go to Illinois, the state where I live. In January 2017, they passed the Illinois Sexual Assault Incident Procedures Act. Some groups got together in 2016 and wanted to find a way to increase and to encourage women to come forward to report sexual assault. Hmm. And so part of that law is that by January 1st, 2020, every one of the law enforcement um, organization would take training, mandatory training that they had to complete. And so I was interested to figure out, okay, what kind of training are we going to give them? And so I looked to the training organization training organizations that offered training for this mandatory training. And I found, I found an organization that did, and that organization is the End Violence Against Women International. And I thought, wow, okay, we have a women's group going to teach our law enforcement officers about sexual assault. One class in particular caught my eye. The name of that class was False Reports. I thought, whoa, okay, so maybe they're not so bad. Let me take a look at this. So I read the rest of the title of the class. Let me just read it to you. False Reports, moving beyond the issue to successfully investigate sexual assault. Whew. I took that class Every single page in that module had at the bottom, start by believing. I looked to see who created that module. It was created by Joanne Archambault, Kimberly Lonsway, and Alan Berkowitz. And let me tell you about those three. Alan wrote a book called Sexual Assault in Context. And it addresses the undesirable, undesirable aspects of masculine culture. He wanted to engage men as allies in ending violence against women. He's one of the authors of this class. The other author is Dr. Kimberly Lonsway. She's an Illinoisan. She provides expert witness services related to sexual violence. She advises researchers and policymakers and the media about sexual assault. In 1994, she wrote a paper and it's 
Rape Myth. It's a paper that she takes an approach that we need to take these rape myths and do away with them. She was making a case against men being the perpetrator. She said these rape myths deny and justify male sexual assault aggression. That was Kimberly Lawn's way. Let's talk about Joanne. Now she's the CEO of End Violence Against Women. She's a retired sergeant of the San Diego Police Department. Her last 10 years there, she supervised the sex crimes unit where thousands of felony assault, um, sexual assaults are prosecuted every year. She put out a training bulletin and it's titled Advocates and Law Enforcement, Oil and Water. She wrote this because in her traveling seminars, she demanded that advocates be able to work with law enforcement agencies when it comes to sexual assault. And she was met with resistance. In one of her speeches, one of the prosecutors stood up and strongly fought against it. I want to know who that prosecutor is. I want to give him cute kudos. After one of her speeches, a group of officers talked to her afterwards and they were asking her about why would we have advocates and officers work together? That's like oil and water. It doesn't mix. She didn't like that. And she used her feminine power to guilt them by talking about, well, the low numbers of women in the law enforcement. And so she wrote that training bulletin about the oil and water and tried to prove her point that yes, advocates for victims should work with law enforcement. And so she wrote this false accusations, getting beyond the issue module. Let me tell you more about the End Violence Against Women International. I looked at their tax documents for 2019 and what I found was astounding, Out outrageous. Joanne is the CEO and she made in 2019 as a retired sergeant, she made $155,000. The second highest paying person there is Kimberly Lansway. And in 2019, she made 124,000. Other wages during 2019 were $514,306. The Violence Against Women, the office, gave them a grant in 2019 for $1,329,708. And Illinois is using the modules that they build to bias investigations, to tell our police officers, believe the victim. Yeah. On December 20th, 2019, my world fell apart. My son was found guilty of something he did not do. I did probably what was you know, is the worst thing you can do when you're worried. I googled false accusations. I thought I'm going to find some help. I'm going to find something, someone to help me with this. I found false accusations are rare. False accusations are a myth. I found believe all women. I was crushed. I felt helpless. I didn't know how to help my son. And God then led me to National Coalition for Men. And there I met Tim Goldich. 
He's an amazing man. He let me come into their NCFM Chicago meeting and I told my story to a group of wonderful men. And then Tim told my story to Mark Angelucci. And I got to talk to Mark. And after talking with Mark, I was hopeful again. My little world that blew up, I was hopeful that I could put it back together and I could make all of these issues right. He gave me the courage to fight. He gave me the courage to stand up for my son. The truth matters. Sadly, we lost Mark early this year. We lost a beautiful man. Meanwhile, God, Mark, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Meanwhile, I went to the NCFM website and I posted a comment. It was a long comment and Harry Crouch thought it was a great article. And Harry posted that as an article on the NCFM website and I was like, oh my God, someone believes in me. Later, I um, joined NCFM Chicago. And guess what? They made me secretary. <laughs> think back high school where I didn't want to be a secretary. My first job was a secretary. I didn't want anything to do with it. I thank God he gave me this opportunity. I'm proud to be the secretary for National Coalition for Men Chicago chapter. Thank you guys. In August of this year, Harry gave me a challenge. He wanted me to take on false accusations of sexual assault, and I did. I am up for that challenge, and I'm running, and I'm running hard. In August, I created NCFM, Deborah and JL's Warriors. We're a group of women who come together because our sons, the men that we love, our husbands, our friends, have been falsely accused of sexual assault. If we think about Deborah and JL, um, the name is kind of fitting because back in biblical times, Deborah was a judge and she was married to Barak of the Israelites. Sisera and his army were going to come in and destroy Israel. And Deborah was the only judge mentioned in the Bible, stood up and said, we have to fight against him. And Barak said, okay, woman, go do what you need to do. <laughs> so she went with them into battle. And it was JL who actually took Sisera down by stabbing him in the head with a, a tent spike. Now, we're not gonna be stabbing people in the head. <laughs> but I thought it was um, fitting in that Deborah and JL successfully saved the Israelites. And they enjoyed peace for 40 years after that. And so the women's group that I've created, we're up to 12 now and we haven't even published anything yet, but we are a support group and action group. We're sharing our pain, warning others, and we are going to change these laws that are against our men. We're going to change these stereotypes that are killing our men. And if we have it our way, we're going to defund and dismantle the Office of Violence Against Women. I have so many women in our group and I wanted them to share part of their stories as part of this video. Unfortunately, didn't have enough time to get it all together. But I have Crystal in our group. She's the fiance to Jerry Cox. Out in Mariposa County, he was falsely accused. 
and now he's losing his land all because of the corrupt world that's going on. You can look that up, Jerry Cox, the real story, NCFM supports him. My friend from school, Cam Brunswick, her son, who has a mental disability in the mind of an eight-year-old, has been accused of sexual assault, falsely. He's innocent. We have Melissa McFadden from Missouri with us. Her son was falsely accused of sexual assault. He's spending 15 years in prison because of the woman that lied. I have Sissy from Florida whose son was accused. And thankfully, the accuser recanted. But all of that publicity ruined his life. I have Carla from California. Her son was falsely accused. And because of all of that negative publicity, it is ruining his career. She's fighting that to this day. I have Katrina from Illinois, and she's giving us the high school perspective. See, when I was in high school, we called people a chauvinistic pig. That was damaging. But even more damaging today are the stories I'm hearing from Katrina about what girls are doing to boys in high school. The girls are accusing these boys of rape because that's normal to them. That's, that's what they're doing and it's scaring me. And Tarana Burke wants to put Me Too in schools? No. I have Deborah from Missouri who's a uh, friend of Melissa. Her son was set up in a sting and he's in prison for something he never, ever would have thought of doing, ever. I have so many others that I'd like to talk about. But in wrapping this up for now, I just want to say thank you, Dad. He passed away when I was three months pregnant with my first. But thank you, Dad, for teaching me those valuable life lessons. I'm coming late to the game. This isn't about my tiny little world anymore. This is about putting an end to toxic feminism. It's about putting an end to the women who are hurting our men and hurting the women, the men, and children and families that love them. Then again, I apologize, but I'm back in the game. My eyes are on what's happening. Tim, thank you for allowing me to join NCFM Chicago. Harry, thank you very much for believing in me. Mark Angelucci, thank you for your encouragement. You rock. My husband, I just want to thank you real quick. Um, without you and your technical knowledge, I never would have been able to pull this video thing off in such a short notice. He's all about the ones and zeros, and I like have no clue how that works. I want to thank my son, Kevin, for being so strong and giving me courage to stand up for the truth. Kevin, we will get your story told. Your truth will come out. With God's help, with NCFM, Deborah and JL's Warriors, <laughs> we're going to get your truth out. And for the rest of the men, again, I apologize for taking my eye off that ball. I didn't realize how much was going on. I didn't realize how much toxic Femininity was out there. I had no idea. But I'm here to fight. And I'm here to raise my voice against false accusations of sexual assault against the men we love. And with God's help and the women at NCFM, we will do that. Thank you so much for taking time to listen. God bless.